Welcome to Kiffin's Keep, an intellectual resource for the pillar and buttress of the truth, which is the church. This is a project of the London Lyceum, which is all about serious thinking for a serious church. I'm Jordan Stefaniak, host of Kiffin's Keep and president of the London Lyceum. And as usual, I'm excited to be here today with you guys again. Before we get started, as a reminder, go ahead and click like on the video, hit subscribe if you're watching on YouTube, and if you are one of our exclusive subscribers to our podcast and you're listening to us in that format, go ahead, jump on YouTube real quick and just hit the like button on the video. It does encourage me to know that people are watching and listening, and also it tells me which videos you guys find more useful and enjoyable, and I'll try to make content along those lines. I don't want to be the guy who just makes content for the stuff that you think you want, but I want to make content for the stuff that I think you probably need. Um, not, not saying that I know everything, but saying that maybe I, I have a good sense of material that you should get engaged in uh, for whatever reason. Today, I want to talk to you guys about seminary education, whether it is necessary or not, and then the question of whether philosophical training is necessary or not, particularly for pastors and theologians. And so this should be fun. I don't, I don't have a ton of notes uh, written up, but I, I have written down a couple of things I wanted to make sure to cover, and we'll see where this goes. Um, so let's, let's go ahead and get started. And if you, again, if you guys have thoughts, ideas, if you think I missed something, if you want to add something, you disagree, go ahead and drop a comment and I'd love to, I'd love to hear from you guys. So the question of whether seminary is necessary seems to come up quite frequently. I remember growing up myself in sort of like the mega churchy ish movement. And it was the, the joke was often, you know, I went to the cemetery, I mean, seminary, with this, you know, the sleight of hand where you're saying if you go to seminary, you go to a place where it's either you'll die or there's just dead, dry, arid theology there and it's nothing that's actually for the life of the church. And then you have on the other end of the extreme people who say, yeah, sure, seminary is fine, but I- I've got everything I need training-wise in my own local church and there's there's no need to engage in a seminary education. So if you're not familiar, I'm assuming you are. Seminary is that sort of like parachurch organization where you have uh, professors who may be pastors, who may have been previously been pastors or may not been pastors at all, and they're teaching various courses to prepare students for going in uh, to become a pastor themselves. So do you need this? No, but you really should go ahead and get a seminary education. I'm going to defend the seminary education uh, from a couple of ways. Number one, and I think this is the one of the most important aspects that people don't often give enough time or thought to, and that is just a seminary education gives you time to season. Most guys who come out of college and who want to be a pastor, if they're in their 20s or even if they're in their early 30s, there has not been significant enough time to just wait And be patient and grow in your Christian faith and grow up in your own character and virtue. And then you go off and they become pastors too soon. They were not ready from a maturity standpoint. I see this across the board. Even people, uh, I've seen all, all over the internet stuff with this Dale Partridge guy. I don't know anything about him other than that there's been like sketchy stuff about his degrees where he was pretending he got degrees that he didn't. Either way, he, you know, he becomes a Christian, um, starts an institute like a year later or something like a very crunch timeline. And then, you know, trying to build out all these things. I think that's very foolish. I think uh, Paul's advice, no, he's not just advice, command in First Timothy 3 for those who are going to be elders, uh, that you not be a new convert is ignored. And that it, wisdom there is not really put to the forefront. You know, when we talk about qualified men being elders, not oftentimes do we give more thought to the fact that you need to be patient and mature. And you see it more often than not, these guys who get really excited, which is great. I'm glad that there are people excited. But what happens or seems to happen is they don't have the maturity. They don't have the depth. They haven't dug a deep enough well to engage fairly and confidently and gently in pastoral care over the long haul. So I would say seminary education, even if for nothing else, causes people to have to slow down for three, four, five years and just be patient. And that will do pastors an innumerable benefit, uh, do churches an innumerable benefit just to have someone who's been patient. And I think this really goes for anybody who makes a big pendulum swing in theology, whether that's 
to from dispensationalism to covenant theology, whether that's from an Arminian to a Calvinist, or whether that's from uh, you know some like a more hardline grammatical historical approach to scripture to something else, or a neoclassical theism to a classical theism, or you know you could reverse any of these things. The the main idea is that people who make big big pendulum swings in theology ought to sit on the sidelines and not pastor for a period of time. I think that's wise. Uh, I think the idea of being given to faddishness is is way too common in our culture. Um, and all the proliferation of sort of the media, the platforms that go on in churches um, can, can easily get guys who they get tossed to and fro a little bit, or they become cage stage, and it ends up hurting congregations. So I think seminary, just from a perspective of time, it slows people down, is a good thing. I think another reason that seminary is not technically necessary, but it's all but necessary, it's, it's right there on the list, is that there are things that you learn there that you cannot learn in a local church because no local church is equipped unless you're like massive mega church. Uh, to to or equipped to really educate you in the things that you need to have to really serve in a church for a long period of time. I, I mean, you, you see the Apostle Paul's own journey where he becomes a Christian. He goes off for a period of time, and basically, I, I'd imagine he's studying and uh, being a, uh, mentored or something like that for a long period of time. I think this idea is is just good for Christians in general, but. There's that reality that, yes, maybe maybe your local church pastor does know some Greek, but he probably isn't super proficient in Hebrew and Greek. And if you want to, to care for your, your church long term, you want to have somebody who can educate you in those things, as well as church history, as well as uh, just, you know, New Testament, Old Testament, a, a lot of the nuances there. Yes, your local church can serve you in those things and can, can equip you, and you can serve in your church the rest of your life and, and be fully equipped without seminary. However, seminary is going to significantly assist you in those things. So don't hear me wrong. I'm not saying that you can't learn everything that you need to learn in your own local church. You can. But it's expedited and it's made significantly better if you have others who have thought about things for their entire lives, serve their own local churches, uh, talking about something for their entire lives to pour into you and to benefit you in that way. Another thing that isn't really thought about oftentimes is the friendships that you develop, the bonds that you develop in seminary. Uh, Pastoring is hard. It is brutally hard at times, and the relationship and emotional toll that it can take on somebody who does it the right way and who truly cares for for their flock and sacrifices their lives for their flock. So this isn't the case for every pastor. Some pastors can insulate themselves and not not ever really engage in the true hard work of pastoral ministry. But for those that do engage in it that way, do engage in it properly and, and will receive the crown of life and, and all of the benefits, hold on just one second. This is what happens when I record during the day. So what was I saying? Oh, friendships. Yeah, that idea. So if, if you're doing pastoral ministry the right way, and you are pouring out yourself, and you are t- you know being wounded, sacrificing yourself, it pays to have deep friendships with those, the, the bonds that you form there in seminary, with those these best friends that you have that you can call and you can just, you know, vent to, cry to, uh, ask questions to. You need those sort of people in your life. And the reality is that most people are not going to go and pastor in a glamorous big church where you have 15 other guys who are fully well equipped and able to discuss things at the level that you need to discuss them or to vent at the level you need to vent without fear of that getting out. So having those relationships is a huge boon to your own pastoral ministry and your own life, um, not only for you, but for your wife. Uh, I think it, from just that perspective, it's a huge benefit. Um, I think, I don't know what else I think. I, there was ideas in my head, but I think you get the point that friendships matter. Um, the time of seasoning matters for seminary, but also just the reality that there are things there that you're going to learn in seminary that your own local church doesn't have the ability to teach you. That doesn't mean that you're not fully equipped, but it does mean you could be better equipped if you are aided by the entire body of Christ, not by your own, just your own local congregation. I hope that makes sense. I I, I want to be clear that like, you know, you're, you're not like losing something or like limping along, but there is just, a, there is something to be said for being taught by, uh, you know, people who've thought 
about theological topics, ecclesiological topics, those things for a long time, and have answers to the questions that you might have and can better equip you in those ways. So I know, I, I get it, credentialing is looked down upon today, it seems like, and for good reason. I mean, I think a lot of institutions have, you know, really like, it's they don't deserve the trust uh, that they've lost. They really don't because of the actions they've taken, the way they've gone about things, I get it. But there is something to be said for being credentialed as a pastor. I think that's a wise thing. It shows that you are com- you're disciplined. It shows that you're committed. It shows that you are not um, someone who's just rushed into something and hasn't really given time to thought about think about it. So I think there's a lot of reasons that it's good and right to be credentialed and to be in order to be a pastor, to go to seminary, to get the education, to build the relationships, to ask the questions. And I think it's going to equip you and benefit you for a lifetime of ministry. So yes, I think you should go to seminary and I think you should really do everything you can to do it. I think you should do everything you can to move somewhere and live there and actually engage in a community there. I understand that's difficult for people who are already pastors somewhere. And in those cases, it it makes sense to me to have sort of a hybrid model of education. But for the young men who either are just married or don't or or not married or have very young families who have the ability to move I would commend and highly 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 suggest and recommend and, and advise to go physically to a seminary to receive that education to receive that oversight uh, to be pushed in the ways you need to be pushed. Now, I get it. A lot of seminary education, ha- the the quality of education is degraded. That's not the case everywhere. It is the case in a lot of places, and that is unfortunate. You're basically doing a bachelor's level degree if you're doing a master of divinity, which there's a lot of reasons for that. Some of that is just because you've got to think in mind, okay, if, if you don't have an undergraduate education in these things, we need to have remedial courses in this stuff. But there's also just the reality of, you know, where we're at, you know, everybody gets an A and so let's slap each other uh, on the back and say, let's go. Um, yeah, I'm, I hope that makes sense. So now the second piece that I wanted to answer and I guess ask the question and answer was, do pastors and theologians need trading in philosophy? And I would say no again, but really they they do and it would benefit them. Let me tell you first why I think both of them can benefit. So one of those reasons is just from the topics that you are engaged in in philosophy. Ethics, metaphysics, epistemology, logic, these things are all huge aids to the pastoral calling and to the theologian's calling. What pastor wouldn't benefit from spending time thinking about ethical questions? What do we do in scenario X? If somebody comes to my church with this background, with this particular scenario, how do I handle that? What's the moral and right and just thing to do? Who's not going to benefit from that? Metaphysics, I mean, this has implications for all of theology and all of life. But there's particular usage in our own context for things like gender, sexuality, questions that are continually going on there. Uh, Having a good understanding of metaphysics would benefit and be an extreme use for pastors and theologians, as well as epistemology and logic. I mean, pastors and theologians, uh, theologians especially, are notorious for not knowing how to form a proper argument. And having training in that in logic would be a huge benefit. And it would benefit preaching because it would help you to think through like how do I logically like explain this pag- passage in a way that makes sense. Uh, so I, I really think training in philosophy is extremely beneficial for pastors. It's almost necessary for theologians. Theologians, I feel like I'm reading theological literature all the time. They don't know how to make an argument. They don't understand the philosophical terms and, you know, they feel like metaphysics or epistemology is a 50 cent word. They're going to throw it out there, but they don't actually understand what's going on in there. And it would benefit their own theological writing if they had official formal training in these disciplines. So, yeah, I would say I would highly encourage training in philosophy as well. It's a handmaiden. It's not necessary, but it's going to be a great use to the pastor and the theologian. And I don't know what, it, I think it, it seems to me that, you know, this this bias against sort of credentialing and bias against education of these sorts is potentially uniquely American in some senses. Um, 
for as long as I'm aware, the history of the church, there's been significant training. And I guess to some degree, you know, if you look at older, older models of education, more classical in nature, they're being taught logic. They're being taught all these things just net. That's just part of everybody's curriculum. And now we don't have that as part of everybody's curriculum. I mean, if you look at the public school education system now, it's a, it's a hot mess and you're not being really taught anything. We're behind and lagging behind in everything. So you need further remedial training and all these things that used to be givens and used to be understood that you knew what was going on here. And you can see that in older pastors, even if you just read somebody like Jonathan Edwards. I mean, yes, he's brilliant in a lot of ways, but you clearly see he's he knows the material that's being taught. Like He understands philosophy. He understands all that's going on there. And he didn't need, you know, you didn't need to go get a PhD to get all that information. It's just, that was part of your, your primary education. And then your undergraduate education was actually teaching you those things. So in some senses, it seems like what I'm saying here is that because our normal grade level educational systems are terrible here in America and in other places, we need further additional training to supplement what we lost and lack there. And so it's not so much like, wow, we need to be just in school the rest of our lives. It's that, well, we missed out on a lot and now we're deficient as theologians, as pastors, as whatever, that we need additional training in these things. Anyway, that's my 15 minute plus take on these things. I think seminary is extremely beneficial, extremely useful. I think credentialing is extremely beneficial, extremely useful. Same thing with philosophy. I am a proponent of these things. I understand that there are potential issues. I understand that there are seminaries that are just terrible, that it's, you know, it's whatever degree you got printed out on a piece of paper. I mean, it's it's about worth what that piece of paper is worth, uh, which was five cents from, from Walmart or wherever you get your paper, Office Depot, I don't know. So I think that's the idea that I'm trying to get across here. I think a lot of people push back on seminary. I don't think they should. I think that's evidence of oftentimes immaturity and a lack of engagement in that area and a fearfulness to admit that we don't know everything and that we do need further help and mentoring uh, on our lives and along our way. So anyway, that's my that's my take here. Uh, thanks for tuning in, as always, to Kip with Keep. Hopefully this was encouraging you. Hopefully it got you thinking. If it gets you thinking, leave a comment. Agree, disagree, don't care. I'd love to hear it. Um, and yeah, so we'll talk to you guys soon, and I'll think with you then. <laughs>